Whoa, dude. My werewolf by night tastes like colors. It's been one full year since the release of Werewolf by Night on Disney+, Plus, and truth be told, I never really expected the MCU to make much mention of it again going forward. It felt like such a self-contained story and an honestly pretty strong departure from the mainline franchise tonally that I assumed they would probably just leave it there. But cut to the present, and not only has there been talk that we might be seeing more of these characters with varying degrees of certainty, but there's also a new iteration that's just come out that has really coloured me surprised. Werewolf by Night in Color. When this got announced, I initially wasn't sure what to think of it. I mean, on the one hand, it could be interesting to see a different version of it, and I guess it's a harmless enough idea as long as the original version is still easily accessible. You know, it's like poetry sort of, they rhyme. But on the other hand, the black and white aesthetic was a very key part of the special's identity, with it being an homage to old 30s and 40s monster movies. I was concerned that this kind of change could seriously miss the point of what gave the original so much of its identity. To get to the bottom of this, I watched both versions back to back. Or rather, I rewatched the original a couple days before the color version came out so I'd have time to finish the script. And I'm ready to compare the pros and cons that come with each style. To be honest, I actually considered making a video on the original when it first came out in 2022, but it just didn't really seem worth it at the time. I enjoyed it quite a bit, but I just didn't have enough to say about it at the time to justify a full video. That's mainly because, as MCU media goes, it feels a little style over substance. But to be fair, that style carries it a fair amount. The use of black and white can be really effective with some intense lighting and heavy shadows which makes for an alert and nervous atmosphere. And despite the release of a color version, the original wasn't exclusively black and white either. The most obvious example being the Bloodstone which is a supernatural artifact that all the characters are trying to acquire throughout the story. The Bloodstone is constantly glowing red which can range anywhere from completely engulfing the screen to just a tiny speck. Either way, whenever it's on screen, it stands out from the black and white no matter how subtle the glow is. It's a beauty, isn't it? It's a good way of making the stone look unnatural and otherworldly from a meta perspective. It's apparently so powerful that even the special's own art direction is unable to contain it. Then there are other uses of colour, like the ending where the conflict has been resolved and the creepy black and white visuals transition into this bright and vibrant colour palette to say that it's all over now and everything's okay. Admittedly though, I do also have some issues with the visual style. Well, this first one isn't really so much an issue and more just something that isn't quite as good as it could have been. That being the film's actual use of black and white. Most of the shots in the movie do look really good like I said, but there are moments where the contrast isn't as strong and it can make the visuals look slightly samey at times. Then there are the special's visual effects which are mostly very good, and I appreciate the commitment to practical effects over CGI to help better imitate the look of classic monster movies, and in general it feels a bit more authentic. But there's one piece of very prominent CGI and it's with the monster character named Ted. Ted. And he just looks off. I think if this was any other Marvel property, this wouldn't stand out as much, but when it's the only major effect like it, it looks really distracting and out of place. I don't know, maybe it was a budget thing, but it did impact my enjoyment a small bit. And this CGI head near the end of the special looks fucking terrible. Like, wow, how did this shot get approved for release? What is it with modern MCU and disembodied heads that they just can't seem to get right? Oh my god, go away. But when I look at the art direction overall, the good definitely outweighs the bad. Hell, even calling it the bad is mostly an overstatement. Aside from a couple iffy effects here and there, the worst the visuals get is just slightly less impressive than they could have been. For the most part, it looks very good and creates a pretty decent atmosphere and can actually be very creative and effective at conveying the story. Fast forward one year and we've now got the release of Werewolf by Night in color. Now, I know I said that I was concerned about the addition of color and how it might take away from the personality of the original, but I did hear a couple of tidbits before release that made me a little more optimistic. First of all, this ain't your same old dime a dozen color palette that you'd find in any movie that comes out nowadays. Instead, the special goes for a technicolor aesthetic, so it still feels like a classic monster movie without sacrificing what made the special… um special. Plus, according to the director Michael Giacchino, it was apparently always the intention to release a color version eventually, and so the special was filmed with that in mind. Saying that though, if I'm being honest, sitting down to watch this new version, I was really not sold on it at first. I remember watching the black and white version and seeing the normally flashy and vibrant Marvel logo suddenly turn all dark and sinister. It was a really good way of setting the tone immediately. 
In contrast, the Technicolor style just doesn't make for as strong of a juxtaposition, which didn't leave a great first impression, and that kind of continued into the opening scene, which didn't do anything particularly interesting with this new style. It basically just looked like any modern Hollywood movie, with the color saturation looking slightly different and with a very subtle film grain effect. And the rare moments of color from the original don't really have the same narrative impact this time around because, well, take a guess. The Bloodstone, for example, has gone from looking completely foreign to the world around it to basically any other glowing rock you'd find in a superhero movie, which is a bit of a shame, unavoidable as it probably was. But then once you let the story progress a little further, the visuals really pick up in terms of creativity. The color saturation gives everything this sort of dim glow which really pops, and the lighting features a lot of gloomy and garish colors which mix and contrast and create this pretty effectively creepy and weird atmosphere. It gives the visuals a lot more variety because environments can look completely different from each other, and it even improves some of the scenes that I didn't think looked all that interesting before. Hell, honestly, even Ted looks a lot better in this context than before. I can still tell he's not really there, this effect still isn't on par with some of Marvel's higher budget efforts, but when everything else in the story has these striking colours that stand out, he looks much less out of place. Honestly, for a shift in style that had me a little sceptical at first, I think I actually prefer this version over the black and white. It's more consistently interesting with how different each scene looks from each other and how different it looks from other horror media that's coming out today. But at the same time, it doesn't outright make the original obsolete. There is no definitive version because each one has techniques that the other can't easily replicate. Personally, I like that you can essentially watch the same special twice and get two somewhat unique experiences, and despite my own preferences, if someone told me they preferred the black and white look, I could totally see where they're coming from. And the art direction as a whole is in service of a story that is… fine, it's good, it does its job. Okay, well, what do I like about it? Well, for one thing, I do have to give credit to a franchise that does sometimes get flack for feeling too formulaic, because Werewolf by Night is fairly drastically different from what we normally see from the MCU. As you can imagine, the tone is a lot darker and moodier than what we're used to seeing, and the plot is honestly pretty small scale by MCU standards. There's not a lot of lighter comedic elements, and even once there can have an unusually macabre tone. Like, this corpse being turned into a talking animatronic so that he can give himself a proper send-off at his own funeral. I'll be... rotting for you. <laughs> I also enjoy the fact that up until the last third, the main characters tend to be pretty grounded in reality, which is a nice change of pace for Marvel. They're not super soldiers or sorcerers or gods or monsters. Well, okay, one of them is a monster, but not for most of the runtime. But I'm also a human, perhaps not in the category that you would call a human a human. They're basically just normal humans. Normal humans that are good in a fight and can apparently tolerate three slams to the head in a stone wall, that's a little weird, but normal humans nonetheless. And yeah, I know that Elsa Bloodstone has super durability in the comics, but that's never mentioned in this continuity, so my point still stands. Truth be told, this is probably the most distinctly different Marvel project since the Netflix shows. It's not quite as unique as those, but there's definitely something there. But while the special has some innovative stuff in there, there's also some fairly generic stuff as well in terms of the story and characters. The characters are all pretty one note, and their chemistry with each other is serviceable, but not really anything we haven't seen before. Jack Russell is a mild-mannered pacifist until the end when he becomes a bloodthirsty monster, Elsa Bloodstone is a misanthropic cynic who has to reluctantly trust him, basically just a less interesting Jessica Jones, Verusa Bloodstone is a cult leader with a holier-than-thou attitude, Ted is a terrifying creature who's really just a big softy. I'm not saying these couldn't be interesting character traits, but I'm not just generalizing. Those short descriptions are basically all they have to them, and they're not helped by the fact that their goal throughout the story isn't very well established. I mean, Jack trying to rescue Ted because they're friends, that's fine, that's perfectly understandable. But Elsa's goal of acquiring the Bloodstone is never given much development. The Bloodstone is a textbook MacGuffin that serves very little purpose other than just giving the characters something to do. Supposedly it can grant all kinds of perks to whoever wields it, but we never get to see any of what that entails or even get to know what Elsa wants with it. What aspect of the Bloodstone are we after exactly? The strength it lends? The protection? Bruce, so what I do with it after I've earned it will be none of your business. 
and none of ours either, apparently. Come on, if you don't want this to feel like a MacGuffin, then give it some perceivable importance to the characters hunting it. Like, maybe Elsa has a dying family member that she's trying to save, or maybe she's trying to use it to help the world in some way, or maybe she initially wants it for selfish reasons, but at the end gives it to someone who she realizes needs it more than her. I admit these are very basic examples, but they're something at least. A good story could definitely come from those. All we really get is Elsa saying this. I came to get the stones, I want to be rid of my dad, my stepmother, all of this for good, and now I'm stuck in here with some fault that's tight. But there's little to no indication of what owning the bloodstone has to do with that. Surely if she wanted to be rid of her family, she could just not turn up. After all, she wasn't even invited in the first place. But to give the story some credit, the climax is actually pretty decent. Jack and Elsa get captured, only for Jack to transform into a werewolf and escapes by tearing his way through anyone that stands in his way. First of all, this transformation is an honestly pretty frightening shot and conveys so much with such little information. The black and white is at its best with flashes of light contrasting against the pitch black shadows, the restrained camera movement and lack of cuts which gives a sense of being paralyzed by fear, and even though we only get to see a shadow of Jack's transformation, seeing Elsa who's usually pretty calm and collected being genuinely terrified by it tells us all we need to know. Admittedly the action itself is just kind of passable, it's mainly just a lot of pouncing and slashing with not a lot of variety, but even the surprising goriness of it it gives it a bit of a unique feel from typical MCU fights. And honestly, that's kind of a good metaphor for the special as a whole. It's not amazing and it's not as groundbreaking as it could have been, but it's entertaining and compared to some other MCU properties that have been coming out in recent years, it feels like a creator's mostly uninhibited artistic vision. Although in a perfect world, I do wish that all these pretty visuals were in service of a story that was more meaningful. As it is now, the novelty of seeing this in color was the main thing that kept me entertained because the story and characters on their own don't exactly stimulate on repeat viewings. But hey, I did still enjoy my time watching it, and at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Anyway, if you like this video, then consider supporting me on Patreon, where you'll get perks like your name present at the end of videos and early releases of future videos. Thanks for watching, and happy Halloween. He said a day too early. Whoops.